to be actual people and systems that help the church grow and flourish. Right. Now, but the flip side, we've got to talk about oh, the, flip the flip side. side. Welcome to Down to Earth Podcast. We're Jess and Joyce, and we're pastors and speakers and happen to be really good friends. We love making deep theology accessible for everyone on this podcast, and we'd love it if you join the conversation. We're also inviting our community of listeners to support the podcast financially this season, so you can become a partner with us on patreon.com forward slash down to earth. As a supporter, you'll have access to bonus episodes, surprise content, and you'll be helping us continue to create content that you really enjoy listening to. We really value all of our down-to-earth community, and we look forward to interacting with you throughout Season 2. Here's to thinking deeply and acting boldly. Welcome to another episode of Down to Earth Podcast. We're glad you're listening and hope that you enter the conversation with us. We love to hear from our listening community. Today we are going to tackle the topic of a biblical framework for leadership. And uh, we're actually going to put, I think, three episodes here that all have to do with leadership. Okay, so this is an interesting topic because I think in some ways leadership is this polarizing topic. I feel like I talk to people who are like, They've read every John Maxwell book out there. They are leadership gurus. They listen to all the leadership podcasts. And then there's a whole whack of people who never want to talk about leadership ever in their life. And they feel like it's been Mm overinflated. They feel like it's been... Too uh, much of a buzz for too long. Right. So you may be sitting in either camp today. And if you're in the leadership camp, you think, well, we're a bit late to this topic. Right. Or you already know all the things. Right. Or you if you're on the flip leader. side, you don't want to hear about it, and so you're going to skip this episode. <laughs> we uh, want you to listen. Um, because I think the word leadership, I will concur with a lot of people that the word leadership has been overused, both in a church context and in a business context. Totally. When I think about my own business experience, oh, if I could have a dollar for every leadership a summit I've been to. Yeah. Why are they always called a summit, too? I don't know. What, what are we summiting? <laughs> a conference hall. Uh-huh. We are summiting the terrible coffee they give us. Anyways, and that's true in every industry. Yep. So you go All, to a... A lot of your professional development for the last 10 years is going to be around leadership. Right. And I think um, some of you might have done some thinking about what it do- what it means to be a leader. Are we all leaders or do we need followers? I've had... Yeah. Very powerful conversations. Yeah, powerful. In other words, not the arguments right with people <laughs> about because I I would live in the camp that I think all of us have something to give in right. terms of leadership. So some capacity to lead. In yeah, some in way. some way. I think no matter who you are, no matter what you are, no matter, there's something that God's placed on the inside of you that could give you the ability to lead. Now I have. Well-meaning friends. I do like how I made them. They're well-meaning. Well-meaning. Okay, There's they a might be right. little condescension. Right, a little condescension there. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think people that I respect that would say that we've gone too far in the leadership world right. and, and that not everybody's we, a leader. Not everybody's a leader. And some people are just followers and there's nothing wrong with right. that. Right, they're not failing. Because at, the, at this point, I think in 2020, if you were to say, I am a follower... You might feel scorned. Well, less than. Right. So, but here's an interesting thing. Some people hear the word leader or they they hear, you know, say a pastor approaches them and says, hey, are you interested in joining this leadership team or we're going to do this leadership development? And their immediate response is, not me, peace out, because they don't believe in it. They don't want the pressure that comes with it. They don't trust leadership. Yeah. They've been hurt by leadership. Even in work environments, even people with capable leadership gifts will turn it down. They know it comes with more money, but it also comes with more headache, more pressure, more well, responsibility. I, I know people like this. I talked to my father-in-law a lot about this. He was a brick mason and worked in a large um, steel company. He, he would always say he didn't want the pressure that came with being... A manager or right. a, or a foreman, he just didn't want that pressure. Right. He would rather work his job and then and Clock then work out. his own business. Yeah. So, like, I think it's a very very real thing. Yeah. So, for a myriad of reasons, people get convoluted ideas about leadership. Well, and I think on the flip side of that, you have people that think they're a leader because they know how to talk. 
<laughs> right. Um, I'm a leader, but it might be a false belief on well, some level. Well, I mean, they can talk a lot of philosophy, but like when you look behind them, nobody's following them or right. listening to them. They're right. just, it's a lot of hot air. Yeah. And also, I think you can talk a good, this is, I think, true of a lot of things. You can talk a good leadership game before you live it. Right. So, I mean, a 14, my 14 year old. Yeah. can talk to me yes, a lot about leadership and what he thinks about all these kinds of things and how the world should be led. And he's got a lot of political ideas and yeah. we are scared, but <laughs> anyways, <laughs> it's fine. He's going to do but something he's really gonna be, interesting. It's going to be fine. Yeah. It's fine because I recognize that to before you do something, you have to be able to explain it. Yeah, and talk you have about to be formed. It. The problem for a lot of us though, is we get stuck in that talking section and you never do it. Well, and maybe we will venture, we talk, we Instagram, and then a lot of us never go past that. Right. Or we prefer to be an influencer rather than an actual leader. Mm. So we're not, we don't mm. have it Call on the ground. Out. Yeah. Call that okay, out. Okay, so leadership at its very core, though, has something to do with power, which is why we're talking about it for three episodes Yeah, like we can't season. have, we, we recognized, uh, as we talked about the season, that we couldn't do a whole season on power and not talk about leadership because... Uh, power is divulged through leadership. Yeah. That's just a truism of the world. Whether you like it or not, yeah. that's true. So historically, I mean, lots of us know this quote, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I always thought it had to do with Oliver Cromwell, but it must have been somebody talking about Oliver Cromwell. In any case, it was uh, that, that phrase was penned by Lord Acton in a letter to an Anglican bishop, actually. Um, complaining about the state of the world. And one of the things, you know, that he was trying to get at is this observation that a person's sense of morality lessens as his or her power increases. Right. So this idea, the more authority you have, more leadership, political or otherwise, um, the more your morality can be compromised. I, I remember hearing this quote as a teenager and being kind of devastated by it. Right, because you wanted to reach well, for leadership as a, teenager, or what? as a teenager, like, you know, you have big dreams about all the things you're going to do. And then I thought, and I have, you read history books, and, you know, by this time you're reading some fairly large arc things, the Roman yeah. Empire closing in on itself, all this. I remember thinking, there's just, like, no hope for humanity. Right. And taken at face value. Yeah, you would exit. Well, this is an interesting thing, because... Um, I had a, a social studies teacher in high school, Mr. Pope, who really impacted me, and mostly because we were talking philosophical um, structures of society, uh, Hobbes and Locke and these kinds of things. And I think it was in high school, I was probably the same age as you, that I first heard this quote. I was like and four also back had then. this. <laughs> Yeah, right. You're not that much younger than me. <laughs> I was you in were pre- in kindergarten I was in when preschool. I was in high school. <laughs> when you Shut were in up. high school. Okay. You could but... have been my youth pastor. <laughs> oh, oh, that's my no. favorite thing of all time, that I can say that. <laughs> you could have been my youth pastor. Yeah, I could okay, have been. Okay, praise God. Okay, it's thing. funny. <laughs> so hilarious. Okay, so, but yeah, I remember realizing, wait a minute. If absolute power corrupts absolutely, what hope is there then for anybody to lead or to bring about transformation in the world? And truthfully, outside of some moral compass that calls you, even if you weren't a Christ follower, something some anchor, some anchor that, that calls holds you. you. Otherwise, we end up Macbeth, right? Like yeah. we end up losing our moorings. So, so I actually think we hear this quote a lot of times and we apply it to Donald Trump. Yeah. We only apply it to, or like to Mussolini, some, or to, yeah. to leaders that are other than ourselves. Yeah, some historical or large figure that doesn't have to do with our daily life in right. terms of how we are right. as leaders. We read this quote and we think, nah, that ha- doesn't have to do with me as a parent mm. or me as the head usher of my church. <laughs> Why yeah. is that a thing? By I don't way, know. Can we just talk We've about talked this? about I would, like, I would like to talk about this for one minute. If you are the head usher in my church listening right now, I'm not talking about you. Just so we're <laughs> aware. Caveat. Do okay, you just have caveat. head ushers? No, but we have some of the lead <laughs> okay. ushers. Well, there you okay. have it. Okay, we're fancy like that. We don't have ushers. Okay, so but listen to me. Why do some people, they get a title 
And then they go mad. Like, they were the nicest person before. Because well, they had an absence of power in their life. I and think then they get... then they. I think we talked about this on a different episode. <laughs> I don't care. It, it keeps me <laughs> up at night. Okay. okay. So, but then you read something like George Orwell's Animal Farm. This was one of my favorite... It's still one of my favorite books. I mm-hmm. think I made my kids read it when they were, like, 10 or 11. They were not ready, ready. to read it. No, they did not they understand it. Right. They were like, Mom, why are you getting us to read a story about animals? We don't understand. I wanted right. them to be impacted. But I think that book, particularly um, at the time that I read it, reminded me that even, even the lowliest of people are affected by Sure, this. the idea, I mean, if you're not familiar, maybe you're not as old as us and it wasn't required reading for you in the ninth grade or whatever. Um, Animal Farm, George Orwell wrote as an allegory commenting on the social revolution in Russia and then the subsequent problems of the communist state and the ongoing oppression of the people. So what they thought was going to be their liberation, when they then got the power, they became oppressors. Right. And, yeah, there's something, you know, sometimes they talk about reverse bias. Uh, we get a heart for this, and then we end up against that. And it, we end up corrupted, potentially, to the level of power we have. I right. think that's the point Orwell was making is certainly the point Lord Acton was making. Power definitely can lead to corruption and oppression. And I think we have to state that power usually leads. Untethered to some moral compass or surrender to God. Yeah. So that's why I think some people think leadership or anything to do with leading is bad or negative. But in fact, it seems like leadership is actually part of the fabric of how God wired humanity. Right. So it might be an intention of the creator. And that idea um, needs to be a little bit explored. Now, by way of caveat, uh, earlier in this season, season two, we talked on episode three about power struggles. And in that, if you haven't listened to that, you can go back and listen. We address church conflicts that may have been caused by toxic leaders Or people may have even experienced spiritual abuse as part of their narrative with leadership. We get that. We get that there are bad leaders, and but that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Leadership in and of itself is not negative by default, and it doesn't mean that it's unsalvageable or, or um, I guess the way we'd say it is, it's it's not evil in and of itself. It could actually lead to flourishing and goodness when leadership is exercised in the way God intended. But I think what we want to say off the top, that leadership must be used with great caution and great humility. Yes, because I think if you don't start from that place, Mm -hmm. then you treat it um, like, like you can just throw it around. Okay, let me give you an example of this. So we built this pizza oven. It's Dave's and my COVID project. It's pretty project. awesome, and I'm going to eat pizza in the backyard tonight. Let me yeah, tell sure. you, people, you wish it's a homemade that you pizza. Were here. We're Italian. There, it's a pizzeria. We're super Italian. It's the best. Okay. We're never ever going out for pizza again. No, and I'm never ordering Domino's. Sorry if you own a Domino's. Okay, but <laughs> I kind of think, and I've been thinking about this a little bit. Uh, you know that leadership is the metaphor for it would be like the pizza oven because it's really useful we can make pizzas but the pizza oven's got to be a thousand degrees before we put like literally a thousand degrees before yeah. we put a pizza in there you can't just like be throwing pizzas around Will you gotta wear it for dave's birthday you bought him big giant gloves mm-hmm. which is great because he was singeing the hair off well his done arms. gloves yeah <laughs> up to his elbows yeah and um like leadership i think at its base we have to say that we must handle it with caution mm-hmm. because you're dealing with fire that's a thousand degrees and you could burn people yeah. really yeah. really easily it's good. if like we that. don't start from there though mm-hmm. if we just pick it up like it's just some, a toy to be played with right or easy or i have a gift or somebody gave me this job therefore i'm the person right fill in the blank yeah so real caution um, healthy fear, maybe, yeah, is the way I that I would a, say. Healthy yeah, fear. Yeah, and so therefore some wisdom and humility being exercised. Right. Okay, so let's get to the biblical principles of leadership, because mm-hmm. this is just you and I meandering around. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think the first, well, the first example we have of kingship is Saul. Right, which was a negative, because Samuel unpacks this for us, broad strokes, 
the people of God wanted a king, but God was to be their king. And so they just wanted to be like the nations around them. And um, they put themselves under an authority they didn't need to put themselves under. And so sometimes people will pull that out and be like, see, God didn't want leaders. God's the only leader and everything should just be right. flat. Right. But that is actually very poor exegesis because yeah, it's there's a difference texting. between leadership and kingship. Right. Plus, you're just in isolation taking one story and not looking at the whole of the biblical framework. Right. Because if you look behind Saul, there were all kinds of leaders. Yeah. Moses, Joshua, sure. like, all the Even judges. Even Samuel being one of the judges. Right. The method of leadership is what God was yeah. um, opposed to, right. not the leader himself. Yeah. That's right. So, especially looking, um, you know, in that Exodus narrative, you have the story of Moses, and he doesn't know how to lead God's people, so he goes to his father-in-law for some advice, which I just always think is such a human thing. Yeah. And Jethro gives him some advice. He says, get some people to lead People over groups of 1,000, people over groups of 100, people over groups of 50, people over groups of 10. And in some ways, that's been like the wisdom forever. Right. That we have these sort of systems and structures of leadership, whether you're in the corporate world or you're in um, the church, it doesn't really yeah, matter. And we I, need structures of leadership. Right. I think I've heard people say before, oh, the way the church is being run right now is not the biblical way. In what way? It was never meant to have bureaucracy. Really? <laughs> How's Exodus so, 18 reading for you? Right. Like, right. Now, I'm not saying that every part that we do, but I'm saying the basic general structure, usually when people are making that, uh, levying that criticism at the church, what they don't like is... They're just saying they don't want anybody in authority over them. Right. They don't like having somebody the boss of them. Or they have an idealism around community that would be like um, kumbaya. Like, let's all... Commune. Yeah. Let's call the commune. Yeah. It doesn't really work either. (laughs) Reading some history, but... You could watch Waco on Netflix (laughs) if you want to know about that. Um, So, but I, I think it's important that we realize whoever Moses appointed as a leader over 10 wouldn't have had the same abilities as the people he appointed as leaders over a thousand. There's a reason or maybe maybe not ability is the right word. The the experience the or the wisdom makeup. Personality, structure, a whole host of things. There's right. re, there's ways and things that make okay, it. Okay, so then you go into the temple construction and you see that okay, to build that temple it required that people were in leadership over different areas. That's the only right. way anything got done. Right. And we all, we hear that Solomon built the temple, but like Solomon didn't didn't do it himself. He appointed people and and the artists feature very prominently both in tabernacle and temple construction. They had different gifts. They had uh, abilities that went way beyond, you know, the average person. And so they had responsibility. And we're we're told that the Holy Spirit blew on those gifts, that the the Holy Spirit hovered over those gifts. So, in fact, their leadership was ordained and anointed. Yeah. It's where we get some of that. Now, we get into cheesiness when people are like, I noticed when you stood up and you said that, that it was very anointed. But it's where we get that language from. We're taking a principle. we're, We're kind of proof texting it, but... It's understandable. That is not just drawn out of thin air. Right. So there's this idea that the the Spirit of God highlights or underscores an approval mm-hmm. for different ones to lead in different ways. You see that in Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall. They organized the rebuild with different areas of responsibility. That actually came largely through familial structures. This family was responsible for this portion, yep. another family for another portion. Well, and you see that with the Levites, to the appointment of the Levites. That mm-hmm. was a familial... Sure. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, you'd say, oh, yeah, but in Jesus. I hear people say this. Then the New Testament is no more like Everything this. Everything flattens thing. out. What are you talking about? There were the apostles. Do you remember that Saul was not um, released Saul Paul to go do mission until the apostles approved. He was under authority in the early church. And Barnabas was his advocate, but Barnabas was also under their authority. So I read the New Testament. When people tell me that, well, under Jesus, it all became soft. I think, no, you didn't read past five minutes. You didn't read past the Gospels. Because if you read Acts and then get into Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2, I actually think it's where we have the most structured leadership. Um, showing up. You can't read Paul and think, 
I think he was about flat leadership. No, no, he was not. He was kicking people out, sending them home, yelling at people on letters. Like, yeah. He was calling people out. And that was not because he was just living flat. Li- he he was the boss. Yeah. And then things like, who, who was he writing to? So he was writing to Timothy, who was leading the church in Ephesus. Or he was writing to the Philippian church. And it's very clear Lydia was leading in that context. Right. So there, yeah, he would write to the whole community, but he would identify leadership structures within that writing. Even looking at the book of Acts chapter six, you see the apostles had responsibilities. Things were getting too heavy for them. Right. There was this conflict with the Hellenist Jews, uh, Jewish widows, and then the Jewish Hebrew speaking widows. And so they said, okay, appoint from among you seven men to oversee this. It was a significant responsibility. This weren't like three widows that needed right. help. And I think when you look at the word oversee there, you realize that that's quite a loaded word in the Greek. It's yeah. not like just people that, no, no it was. They weren't running a feeding program. You're pointing people to leadership, major yeah. leadership and positions. it's interesting when you look at that in the beginning of Acts 6. So you've got the apostles doing the thing they're supposed to do. You've got Stephen and Nicanor and whoever else the other people were in that list um, that ended up being with this responsibility for this ministry to the widows. But then it says many more priests came to the faith. So these are guys that, you know, are already our leaders in the Hebraic community. And then they come to know the Lord. Well, they don't just transfer in as like regular people because they were, they're priests. Mm -hmm. So now they have responsibility and authority. There's definite indicators that there's this kind of um, leadership structures and mechanisms that existed in the well, early church. Well, and I think historically, so if we even take ourselves out of the biblical context and say historically, how could Christianity have um, multiplied the way that it did? Without some of that Without structure. very strong leadership structures. Any historian is going right. to tell you that so, it didn't happen. And I think we get to thinking about things like this, like magic pixie dust. And the Lord doesn't, he uses natural processes. Our right. rain doesn't come to, it comes to us through a natural process. Yeah. Just like the the promulgation of the gospel came through natural leadership processes. Yeah. So part of the difficulty people have with leadership structures, especially today in our, our culture, in the West in particular, is because we have come um, through modernity and we've been in this season of post-modernity for some time. In post-modernity, we don't have time to unpack, but suffice to say that there's a, a dismantling of what has been and that things being built um, systematically or one on top of the other, we challenge. That's part of the worldview these days. Okay, so I get that. But what, what came out of that post-modern wave um, in some streams of the church was something that is actually now branded and spoken of as a thing called the emergent church movement. Right. And I'm old enough to have been a part of some of the emergent early conversations. And um, definitely there were some really good things that came in terms of challenging our understanding of the gospel or um, how, how did church have to be? Do we have to sit in pews? Do we have to stand up, sit down? We do, do we have to have talking <laughs> heads? Um, some of those questions were good, but the emergent church would identify themselves as having a value system based around fluidity, um, or so like less or no structure. Uh, they would value a multiplicity of voices and a dialogical format for learning, which obviously Jess and I are part of, or we wouldn't be doing a dialogical podcast, but, um, they wanted it to be hard to tell who was leading. That was a way of being able to say we value everybody, nobody over against one another. Right. And I would say that, you know, I think if you're leading at this point in time, you've definitely been, unless you've been living under a rock, you've been influenced by that. Even if you've never heard of the emergent church. Right. So, like, I think most of the time when I'm speaking, I'm going to tell my church two times out of four that we believe in a flat kingdom in that nobody is better than anybody else. Right. The emergent church took this a lot further though and said not just flat kingdom but flat, flat structures. structures. Yeah. And flat and that there would be no leader and so it was a, a very real reaction over against what had, they had experienced as very top down hierarchical structures as well as programmatic systems that I think um, it would be safe to say they felt were less authentic. Right. So the reach was good, 
But it became an idealism, in my opinion, yeah. that didn't have long legs to stand on. I, I, yeah, it became idealism that is not um, in the DNA of people, Humanity. like literal DNA. Like, yeah. And what was Which, interesting to me is I would read these books about less structure, but then I'd think, yeah, but the people writing these books are wanting to be the leaders of this movement. Right. So in some ways... What are you it, talking about? I don't understand what your point is because yeah. you want to be seen as the expert. You want to go to the conference and speak at the conference about no structures, but you want to be seen as the expert and the leader. So what it tells me is that you just want to be the boss. Right. Or you have an idealism that you think you're the person to espouse. But how does it have, you know, uh, a long arc on it? It, it doesn't, well, in it my opinion. Well, it becomes Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Right. To me, that that like I'd read these books and think, what we're what we're aiming for here is Lord of the Fries. Nobody's the leader, and then everybody kills each other. Right. There's another high school read that. Right. I'm bringing it all back getting, today. Getting at the power basically stuff. Basically, I was in, in high school, school five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> hilarious. It's a good Friday today, oh, everyone. People. Okay. So, <laughs> in order for people to flourish, especially for the church to flourish, there has to be some leadership structures. There have to be actual people and systems that help the church grow and flourish. Right. Now, but the flip side, the flip we've side, got to talk about oh, the, flip the flip side. side. Hyperinflation of authority. So that's, um, I, and I think there has been like a, a real resurgence of this. Partly, well. it always, whenever you go to one side of a ditch, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that run over to the other side of the ditch. So while the emergent church is emerging, and people are saying flat structures and kumbaya, and I don't know if they really were saying kumbaya. <laughs> no, but... Felt like they were. Yeah. They were saying... Felt like they, they okay. were saying... Then a whole bunch of other people said, nah. So now we're going to hyperinflate the authority of the pastor, and you might have heard messages about honor. It, it, I think I yeah. think we've had a little lessening of that over the last maybe 18 but months, two years. it swing too far. Like... Pastors were doing like eight week series on please honor me. Right. Or other people were teaching on it and then people would camp out on it. Like if we don't honor the pastor, the Lord's not going to bless the community. And Right. And if we challenge anything anybody as, says, then we are like heretics, which no, that's not biblical either. You, you had Saul, Samuel always cha- challenging Saul. Samuel, again, challenging David. There was challenge to the leader. You right. don't become a good leader without challenge. Right. So I think that cre- that created its own set of problems in We're, that, yeah. you know, and I think that sets people up for spiritual abuse, uh, yeah. basically for cult-like behavior that yeah. the leader can never be challenged. So even like what is the resurgence in the evangelical church of neo-Calvinism right. has in it a, what I think is a um, an imbalance inflation of the authority of the pastor. And Correct. I would caution any of our listeners who are part of that stream of the church to be careful yeah. that we don't set up a leader as being like second to God. Yeah, and I think none of us were the voice okay, of God okay, to us. Okay, so now I, I would say though, nobody who's in that would say that I have set up my pastor as second to God. But so you have to look for the hallmarks of what does that look, look like. like? Because I don't think any of us, it's kind of like saying, do any of us admit to ourselves that we're full of pride? No, we have to look at the hallmarks of what that yeah. what that means. So I, I think that happens. I think the hallmark of it is if you feel like you can't challenge the person who's leading you. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that they might have a big personality and so you're afraid. I'm not talking about your fears. I'm saying like they would categorically not receive right, or have anybody in their life that they're right. receiving that from. Or that they would vilify whoever challenges as uh, a dissenter, somebody who's divisive, somebody who's going to try and break the church up. Or if you have language like this, this is the, and this is a real life thing, uh, that the pastor gets the vision, the people have to follow the vision. Like there, there is cult likeness in that. Yeah. If you have a coloring book made after your pastor, you may want to think twice <laughs> about that church. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Those are some of the issues, the hyperinflation, the flattened leadership. But I think another issue that we have to talk about with regard to current leadership dilemmas in the church is an overlooked generation of leaders. Yep. And I think there are people who feel very underempowered or not seen. Like, nobody made room for me. A few years ago, I 
uh, was talking about this with some key leaders in our denomination and we heard resoundingly from people that were mid-30s to mid-40s no one gave us a chance and now you're looking for the young leaders so you're empowering people that are 20 to 29 or whatever but what about us when's it going to be our turn right and partly this is not a church issue this is a sociological issue Mm -hmm. so businesses are finding this too it's partly because we're and i mean not all of it is for bad reasons partly we're healthier so executives, even in the business world, they're staying there till they're like 75, and partly because we're all drowning in debt, so we've got to keep on, we're on the, like the Freedom 95 challenge, yeah. or the Freedom 95 track, so yeah. I think we have people staying longer. I w- yeah, I think that's true. I also think we have um, perpetuated youth, so we have perpetuated a value around being young, um, trying to be youthful, but mm-hmm. then what ended up the the flip side of that is then some older leaders don't see you as valid because they think you're younger than you are, right? Or uh, they have overinflated the importance of getting a twenty two year old uh, to do something, right? As opposed, and they've under like you you're past your prime at twenty nine, right? Well, I could be accused of sometimes reaching for people who are younger to the detriment of overlooking the people in that middle category. So I think it exists. The other thing is I think we have the reality of some not ready leaders. Yeah, so I, I also think, so on the flip side of that, I would say there's, there is a perpetuation of youth. That I, I think we have people growing up later. Sure. So all the sociological studies say a uh, young adult goes to 34 now right. and has probably for 20 years. Because they aren't actualizing into their adulting. So I don't know. So so you might be a 30-something-year-old leader and you're mad because no one's given you a chance. It could be that you don't have the chops because you're still a baby. I'm right. just going to call it like it is. You're still a baby. You haven't... In what way? Well, you're not an adult. You don't do adult things. You don't have control of your finances. You don't have a vision for your life. You haven't finished school. Right. You you aren't faithful to your commitments. You're not. Yeah, you're flighty. Let right. me just but, camp right. out there for right. a few minutes. Like, I, I think, so I think while there are people that are genuinely being overlooked, for sure, and we've got to address that, we also have to address the other end that, that allows people to stay like babies. And, right. They and, think they, they should lead just by virtue of their age. And or they want their... to lead without sacrifice. Yeah. So I think the call to leadership is a call to sacrifice. Yeah. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot lead without sacrifice. If it doesn't hurt, I think you aren't leading. Right. So there's an idealism about what it means to be a leader that, that sometimes can sit there. Somebody saying, no one's giving me the opportunity. But what might be missing is a readiness or an ability now, to lean into that. Right. Now, as I say, that if it doesn't hurt, you don't lead. I'm thinking to myself, I'm kind of disagreeing with myself as I say that. <laughs> I was, well, I was, well, because, because I think then we get this overinflation of like, you remember in the 80s, Joyce, or 90s, when we first got into leadership, people would say, it's very lonely at the top. Right. Like, if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have no friends, yeah. and your life is going to be very lonely. And really what that was, was the leader, whoever was telling us that, just didn't have any friends. Right. Like, they were just a lonely person. And they'd set up a type of elitism where they couldn't find their peers or their mutual. Because they were too busy being better. Right. Okay, so, like, I think in some veins, if I say that leadership should should hurt, I mean, taken to its extreme, that's crazy. That becomes like... Sure, but it could be something like, no, you just remain faithful to your commitment because you said you would do that thing. Right. Rather than you got an invite to go to something that seems more fun than the thing you said yes to. Right. Or like your church is not quite as cool as it was six months ago. Right. And now somebody opened up something new and cool down the street, so you're going to go there. I mean... And you feel called to go lead mm, there, right? Right. Yeah. Those are my favorite conversations (laughs) to have with people. Okay, so, but but here's a... Here's another thing, and I think I, I want to say this to anybody who's in leadership that's listening, that's maybe our peer. Obviously, we have some younger listeners, but we might have people who are in significant places of leadership. A couple of years ago, there was a conversation with some leaders in the part of the stream of the church that I'm a part of, and one of the things that got brought up was they were really excited because they were releasing this 
woman to church plant and to lead this community. And I just had to speak up and say, it's not a feather in our cap when we're releasing somebody at the age of 42. Like it would have been great if she was released 20 years ago, but don't call her a young leader and say that you're doing something right and good by empowering her to lead. That's right. not I think a young this is leader. Per- I think this is particular for women. Like you don't actualize to your 50. Right. It's annoying. Yes. We can just don't, say don't that. Don't do that. Okay. Just, okay. So I think the bottom line though to all of this is that authority and leadership matters. Yeah. If you aren't under leadership, you're going to get yourself into trouble. I think that point blank, I think that for you as a person, who are you under? Whose authority are you under? Yeah. I think that truthfully for churches and sw- that could be a why- whole episode in and of itself because we push so hard against that as individualists right so yeah we're under authority of the government we're under authority of the law we're under authority there's a lot of places in our lives but even local church um, authority and for whoever is the leader i happen to be the lead pastor in a community so do you but we're still under authority 100 percent. So our boards our elders leadership our teams leadership teams our denominations respectively and and i happen to work for a denomination um like national office but even my national directors who are my authority they're under the authority of the national team so right. it's like this we're always being able to be held to some level of accountability. Right. And I think um, I think sometimes uh, there's been like a pushback against authority. And I think particularly um, as we've exegeted passages about women and all, all this kind of stuff. But the truth is I am under my husband's leadership as well. Right. As he is under, we submit to one another. One another, that, out of that, reverence for Christ. Yes, and for each other. We, yeah. we respect each other. So, it like, particular, I mean, I even think as we do this project, this podcast, if our husband said that's enough, you're not doing that anymore? Yeah, we wouldn't be quitting because they said that. No, but we that would makes be, it sound like they We would be having around. conversation. <laughs> we ask them for their wisdom and their input. And if they both were waving red flags at us for any project we were working on, I think we would listen. Yes. I like Maybe it. with a Think. fight. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so here's the thing. You just got to get under leadership. If you're not under leadership right now, you're flat, flapping around and saying that this podcast is your church nonsense. No. We're not you're not under authority. We don't even know you're listening. Well, we do. Right. That but makes it sound maybe mean. not particular. Yeah, you got to get under leadership. There has you got to be get under somebody eyeball the eyeball that can say to you, "Hey, hey, hey, what's going on there?" Right. Some, it could be a small group leader. It could be um, a local pastor. If you're already in a role in leadership, don't ever set yourself up to be the uber leader without anybody in authority over you. Yeah. you that is going to end badly. Yeah. And if you find yourself uh, always having feedback now by feedback for your leaders, it kind of belies your own arrogance. Right. Right. Like if there are the some people that if you're called by God to always confront the pastor, no, that's probably not the call of God in no, your life. No, there's nowhere scripturally that you can see that, that that's a job. It's not right. a job. No. You're not Samuel. <laughs> I'm just going to say that, throw that out. So I think uh, all of us, and I think this is true of me too, like I, I think I have to check myself often. Like, am I, am I always having like a bone to pick with the people that are leading me? If that's true, there and, might be something wrong. Yeah, there might be something that I'm dealing with and that I yeah. and that I must come under authority. Yeah. Okay, so we've obviously got a lot to say. We got a couple more episodes coming up about leadership and we're going to even do some what we think how to grow as a leader. Uh, so hopefully you'll keep tracking with us here and write to us um dte podcast at gmail.com if you have something big that you want to tell us in regards to leadership um, follow us on instagram and other social media platforms and let's just keep the conversation going yeah we like your feedback hey thanks for listening we hope you enjoyed this episode you can follow us on facebook or Instagram, or go to our website at www.downtoearthpodcast.com. Feel free to leave us a review wherever you find your podcasts and spread the word. Bye.